everyone on today's webinar topic is everything you wanted to know about the BC Employer Training Grant. Uh, and uh, our guest here, I would like to introduce Sean Terralon. Uh, Sean is, is the Senior Policy and Program Manager with the Employer Training Grant, uh, and he's involved in all aspects of the program delivery, and he is committed to making the program as easy as possible for employers to access. Uh, also, from talking with Sean, I understand he's a big fan of mountain biking, and if you need advice on where to ride on Vancouver Island, well, you can ask him that too. Uh, but we'll try to keep uh, today's webinar primarily focused on Sean walking us through the grant application process. So welcome, Sean. Thank you very much, Ken, and um, thank you for having me today. Yeah, um, no, I, you you have a PowerPoint uh, and a few things to take us through. Uh, I just wanna let everybody know before we get started, uh, this being the webinar is being recorded, uh, so you can always refer back to it. Uh, and at the end, uh, our producer, Eva, is going to assist in taking your questions. If you have a question, you can just enter that into the chat. We'll answer those at the end of the presentation. Uh, and if you just don't want to type it in, uh, I think you can click your hand there uh, and just ask uh, Sean a verbal question. Uh, so, Sean, thank you very much. And uh, we can get started. Perfect. OK, I'll share my screen here. I've got a little bit of a, an introductory presentation. OK. So I'll start off just by covering the employer training grant very briefly uh, from a very high level, just to make sure that those who might not have participated in our previous uh, presentation uh, understand uh, what the ETG is and uh, how it can help uh, their business. So um, at, 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 we've, got, we've got eligibility criteria and at a very high level, um, the program exists to support employers to train their workforces in almost any area that the business needs. So all we ask is that the training is related to the needs of the business and the participant's job. And so with that, um, there's a couple of pieces of key eligibility criteria that I'll highlight. There are some parameters. Um, the program reimburses employers at 80%. So the government will pay 80% of uh, training and training related costs while the employer is expected to kick in uh, the remaining 20%. Uh, the good news is that employers can apply as often as they need, um, and they can receive up to $10,000 per participant or per employee, and up to $300,000 each year. Um, I mentioned this briefly, training must align with the needs of the business and the participant's job. Um, training cannot exceed 52 weeks, so the program is designed to support employers who are looking to deliver short-term skills training uh, that results in a better job. And we don't fund uh, diploma or degree programs. So those are the high level pieces of criteria. Um, there are a few steps to, uh, to receiving a grant. The first thing that you're gonna wanna do is create what's called a BCEID. This is free to uh, any business and it allows companies to uh, engage with the province. Um, you'll need this in order to log into the skills training grant system, which is where you'll apply for an employer training grant. The next thing an employer would do is identify exactly what training needs their employees require. Uh, they would go ahead and submit an application, wait for a decision. Um, ideally, they would receive a decision uh, before uh, training be begins, and uh, it would be um, uh, the, the responsibility is on the employer to pay for the entire cost of training and then begin training. And then once training begins, uh, to submit a reimbursement claim. So it's a bit of a two-step process. Uh, you apply for the um, you apply for the grant, uh, you'll get approved, but then you'll have to submit a reimbursement claim in order to um, receive that 80% once training starts. So for the rest of the presentation, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna walk you through step number three, what it's like to submit an application. And my hope is that um, uh, you'll see how easy it is um, and that you'll, you'll be um, encouraged to apply. Uh, before I do that, I, I should mention um, that uh, we do support training in electrical vehicle maintenance. So for example, last year, we approved 45K for 11 employers to upskill workers to help repair and maintain electric and hybrid vehicles. There's other training related uh, that would be eligible, such as any, any, any skills training related to electrical vehicle infra infrastructure, installation or maintenance. 
um, as well as anything that a um, that a dealership or a or a or a, 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 a maintenance shop would require related to sales and marketing to effectively communicate uh, with folks. So, um, um, a really broad uh, program that will support employers to uh, train their employees in almost any area, um, as long as those high level criteria are met. All right, so I'm going to switch screens here. Uh, bear with me. I hope everybody can see the uh, application homepage. Get a thumbs up. Yeah, OK, great. So once you have a BCEID, um, you can visit, and I can, I can share the, uh, the login page. It's also on our homepage on the web. Uh, once you have your BCEID, you log into the Skills Training Grants system, and you're presented with a page that looks like this. And um, I've, this is just a test uh, account, and I'm just going to kind of go through things and talk out loud and hopefully answer any questions that you might have. Uh, please, if you have any questions about the application or the program, um, uh, if you want to forward those to, uh, um, to Eva, uh, I can answer those at the end of the presentation. So the first thing that this is telling me is that my organization's North America, my, my organization's Canada North American industry classification system codes are currently out of date. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, it also says that my organization's business information documents are currently out of date. So what I'm going to have to do is go into my organizational profile before I can submit an application. So if I go up here to organizational profile, I can access, watch it not load here now that I'm doing this live. Let's see. Ah. Give me one sec here. Didn't know you were a doctor, Sean. <laughs> there we go. Let's try that again. Organizational profile. Okay, so this is this is uh, a profile that every organization will have to complete. It asks for basics about your business so that we can ensure that you're operational and that you're eligible for the grant. Uh, I'm going to jump down to uh, the sections that it's asking me to fill in here. So I'm going to say that I'm a profit company. Uh, you can choose your legal structure. We'll say, sure, I'm a, I'm a partnership. I was established in 2017. Let's say I've got 10, peop uh, 10 people worldwide, and I'm actually 10 MBC. Uh, every year I spend, let's say, $5,000 on training, um, and I train Let's just say everybody gets trained every year. One of the important things that you're going to have to do is choose this NAICS code. Um, this is important for us. Uh, it basically helps us categorize you into a, a specific industry. So what you'll have to go through and do here is uh, um, uh, choose, starting with the first drop down list, choose the um, option that best suits the nature of your business. So I'll go in here and uh, just start selecting some. Uh, let's just go here. Okay, something to this effect here, until it, until it offers no more options there. That's complete. What it's asking for next is some business information documents. So what we require is that every business that's required to have a business license to provide a copy of that business license. Um, there are some municipalities and uh, uh, districts, regional districts across the province uh, for which a business license is not required. And in those instances, an employer can provide other documents to demonstrate that they're operational. So I'm going to go in here and try and find um, an example of a business license that I have. Somewhere on my desktop, I believe. All right, there we go. Okay, this is my, let's just say 2023 business license. Okay, um, I've got a, um, um, a website. Obviously you'd put in the actual URL, a description of my business. Um, we sell and maintain vehicles. Obviously yours would be a little bit more sophisticated than that. Um, let's just jump in here and say one, two, three, what's it gonna give me? Is it gonna give me an address that I can choose from? Nah, so I'll just put in, let's just say one, two, three, Fort Street. Victoria, okay, looks good. Okay, and I've got to click save to make sure, and I believe I did that. So I can go back to the home page. 
And now I can start those, those two alerts have disappeared and I can start a new BC employer training grant. So it's giving me a little bit of a warning here that says employers and authorized employees are the only ones who could submit uh, an application on behalf of the business. Uh, we don't accept applications to be submitted by third parties. Uh, with that in mind, we can go ahead and click BC Employer Training Grant here. The description is just a very short description of, of the grant. And I'm going to choose, let's choose tomorrow. Let's just pretend that tomorrow, training starts tomorrow. So I'm going to choose June 28th, 2023. Let's just say it goes until next month sometime. Uh, we've got a question here for uh, employers who have been impacted by a downturn in the forest sector. So if that uh, pertains to you, click yes. But if not, just click no and click continue. It will not affect your application whether you say yes or no. It's just for tracking purposes. So this is really the, the dashboard that you're going to be looking at when you begin an application. And there are five sections that you're going to have to go through. In addition, um, participants are also going to have to fill out uh, what's called a participant information form. So I'll go through each section in turn. Uh, the first one's already complete. Uh, I'll jump to the uh, training program section. Just a little bit of a reminder here about what is eligible and what's not. Um, and so the first thing it's going to ask me for here is the course program or certificate name. So I'm going to say EV uh, upgrading. Let's go with that. Um, um, here you will put in a description of how that training um, is relevant to the needs of the business. And then also um, how the training is relevant to the employee's jobs. If there's a link to the course description, you'll put it in here. And then you'll have to upload a course outline so that we have something to evaluate. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to choose a document. These course outlines, they can be provided by the training provider, downloaded from the training provider's website, um, or they can be um, um, the screenshots of the, of the website if that's all that they have available. Uh, the training start date I've already selected. I'm going to say that the primary delivery method is going to be um, online. It's going to take 100 hours to train. Skill level is upgrading. Uh, the skill focus is an industry recognized credential. You could also choose technical skills. Let's just go with industry recognized credential. And the expected certificate would be a industry recognized credential. Um, let's just say EV maintenance or something to that effect. Have I offered this in the past? Yes. Have, uh, have I received or requested any government or third party funding for this training? No. If you select yes, we're going to ask you uh, uh, to describe the other uh, funding sources that you're getting for this training. Uh, we won't fund um, any training that's already being paid for by another uh, source. OK, great. So we've got the training program section complete. I'm going to jump ahead and, and go to the training provider section. So my training provider is, um, let's just say, um, um, the Automotive Experts of Canada. The type of training provider, it's a private training institution. And the address is, uh, let's say, four, five, six. I'm just going to choose something in Saskatchewan, even though we require, um, well, let me see if it'll let me see. Yes, so training has to be delivered in. We ask that uh, employers choose training delivered by a training provider in British Columbia, unless there are exceptional circumstances and that type of training is not available in BC. So keep that in mind. Uh, the training provider contact information, I'm just going to say first name, last name, First, last at email.com. Thanks for bringing with me here as I fill this all out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Um, so if you did choose, um, um, what it's asking me here is, is what are the alternative training options that I considered? Uh, so share details of alternative BC-based training providers or courses that you considered. And we use this to make sure that you've done your due diligence and you're choosing training that uh, demonstrates good value for money. Um, so I put in here an explanation. 
and then why you chose the um, training provider that you chose. And so I'm going to say that uh, they have the skills needed to deliver this training. And they're cheap. OK. All right, so I'm going to jump ahead to the training cost section. The number of participants I plan on training is two. And once I fill in the number of participants, I can go down here and click Add New Expense Type. And then you'll see this little piece open up down here. And we're going to go and find tuition, tuition fees. I'm going to say that it applies to two participants. And the total expense for tuition for all participants is, I'm going to say, $10,000. See, the cost per participant is calculated at $5,000. When I save it, it'll automatically show you the employer contribution and the requested government contribution, keeping in mind that the employer training grants a cost shared program, and we will pay 80% of the costs where the employer pays the remaining 20. OK, so let's jump ahead. There are other expense types that are eligible, um, and you can choose from the drop down list there. Um, the last section before I can submit my application is related to uh, participant information forms. And so this page I should probably mention is, is it might look a little bit different if you apply in a few weeks. Uh, we're working on making it a little bit easier to invite a participant to submit their participant information form. But basically what you need to do as it currently stands is click on this show participant inv invitation button and you'll see this email that you can um, send to uh, participants from Outlook or whatever email uh, client you use. And then they'll receive this link, uh, which will allow them to go in and fill out their participant information form. And we need participants to fill this out themselves. So I'm just going to run through the participant information form real quick. Um, there's a lot of um, information about the, the employer, the contact name, the training description, and the start date um, in order to participate. Each participant has to provide a certain amount of personal information. Uh, you can read through this, uh, or the participants can read through this to make sure that do you know if they're on EI or IA, uh, that they um, they get approval so that their uh, benefits aren't impacted by participating in training. Uh, folks will need a social insurance number, and they'll also need to um, know what their national occupation classification code is. And there's a similar drop down to the, the NAICS code that I had to choose on the organizational profile. There's a similar drop down section for the occupational classification in the participant information form. Um, okay, with that, I'm gonna say I'm not a robot. And I'm gonna say I'm going to attend training and that allows me to begin to fill out the PIF. Oops, just say, sure. Uh, social insurance number. Hold on a second. I've got a test number. Um, one moment, please bear with me here. phone number, email, okay, let's just say name at email.com, I'm gonna say, this is where I live. Yep, looks good. Okay, demographic information, uh, Canadian citizens. Um, uh, so the program, the program doesn't support temporary foreign workers, uh, for example, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to choose Canadian citizen. Um, do you consider yourself an, an Indigenous uh, person? I say no. Do you no. Uh, no, I did not come here as a refugee. As a minority, no. Uh, gender, uh, male. Do you consider yourself a person with disability? No. Marital status, single. Form of dependence, um, one. Official language, let's say English. And the highest level of education, you choose, the participant will choose uh, whatever um, is most applicable to them. I'm just going to go here. What was the last high school you attended? Um, sure. And the last, uh, what is the city? Um, I'm just going to say Victoria for the purpose of filling this out here. OK, so next up is uh, I'm going to have to choose um, my employment status. So I'm going to say I am currently employed. Have I received or am I receiving employment insurance? I'm going to say no. 
were, was I employed by? And this will automatically populate with the name of the employer who's submitting the application. Uh, so was I employed by them um, uh, who's supporting the training on this date, which will also be automatically populated? I will say yes. How long have I been in this job? Two years. Am I an owner or part owner? Nope. Over the past three months, how many hours a week did I work on average? I'll say 40. Type of employment, I'm going to choose um, permanent. All right, so my hourly, hourly wage rounded to the nearest dollar. Let's just go ahead and say something like 35. Current job title is um, uh, maintenance. Okay, and this is where they're going to have to choose their national occupation classification code. Uh, this one can be a little bit tricky. Um, so, um, um, uh, some participants might need help with this part, but uh, most people find it um, relatively intuitive if they start on the top drop down and work their way down. So I'll say, um, let's see here, let's go to sales and service, um, retail sales, retail sales supervisor. I'm not choosing something that is aligned with being a, a maintenance person, but uh, I just want to get through this quickly. So I'm choosing those ones as an, just as an example. I currently perform this, let's just say Richmond. And after training job title out, let's just say I'll be a supervisor. And my national occupation classification. So it's same thing, but after training instead of before training. And so I'll go in here and kind of choose something similar. Corporate sales, maybe. Okay. I'm not an apprentice. Uh, I am not participating in any other training programs. And as a result of training, I expect a promotion to another position. Uh, the month field is required. Okay. Where did I miss that? Oh, zero months. Okay, there's just a little bit of a, a blurb here on uh, how my personal information will be used. And then I provide consent and certification and the PIF is complete. So when I come back here, this has changed from incomplete to in progress. As an employer, before I can submit uh, to review and submit my application, I need to come in here one more time after the PIF's been completed and I need to choose the selected training outcome of the participant. And so I'm gonna say uh, there will be a promotion. Yes, done. Okay, it should say complete promotion. Oh, it says that I must ensure the participant information form submitted is equal to the number of participants. So if you remember, I put into the cost section that I was gonna train two people, but I only submitted one PIF. I'm just gonna go change the number of people to one so I don't have to do another PIF. There we go. Okay, uh, my, my, my application has not been submitted, but it's ready to review. So I click down here. And I basically have an opportunity here to, to review all of the information that I've, that I've um, put into the application. And if it looks good, I can continue. A declaration as the employer now that I am, you know, submitting this on behalf of the business. Everything in here is true and accurate. So I can submit that. And that's it. You can see here that the application is now complete. So that was a that was a pretty quick walkthrough. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. That's the entirety of the application. It was, uh, it was pretty uh, quick and dirty there, um, but I hope it gives you a sense of everything that's involved and um, um, I hope uh, uh, how easy it is to submit an application. Um, we, we respond to most applications, I'd say in about two weeks. My advice to every employer who's applying is to apply, is to apply as early as possible. If you can apply, the longest anyone will ever have to wait is 60 days. So if you can apply 60 days in advance, I know it's a long time sometimes, uh, you'll be guaranteed almost, uh, you essentially be guaranteed a decision before the training start date. If you can apply 60 days before the start date. Uh, that said, most people get a decision within two weeks. Um, yeah, um, 
I, I think that maybe I'll just leave it there. And I don't know if anybody had any questions, but maybe we can use the remaining time to, to address any of those that folks might have. We do. Uh, I see a lot of questions in, in the queue, and I'll hand it over to you, Eva, to, uh, to ask them for you. Um, so you have streamlined the application process. So thank you for, for going through that quite thoroughly. Um, does the information that you enter, especially about your employer information, does that save in the computer? So when you have to reapply, you don't have to enter all that in again. It just so it the organizational. That's a good question. The organizational profile will remain, and so you don't need to re-upload your business mm -hmm. license or anything like that, um, because every application is for a different uh, kind of training. Let me let me just mm -hmm. clarify something. You can add as many participants to an application as you want, as long as the training is the same for all people. Uh, right. You will have to submit a separate application for each program or course. Uh, okay. So in that case, you'll have to fill out the uh, training provider and the training program section again. Right. Uh, it's just interesting to note as well, the wide variety of the different modalities of training as well. It doesn't have to be some in-person classroom training at BCIT at Lower Mainland. It can include uh, online or hybrid. Uh, and um, uh, and even on the EV, it can be EV awareness and safety training as well done online. Like yeah, just absolutely. Stuff. So excellent. Uh, let's turn things over to Eva, um, and I see a bunch of questions in the queue, so why don't we begin tackling them? Yeah, we have many questions. Uh, first of them is if uh, a multi-shop operator um, can have a VCE ID for each location, or how does it work? Can somebody explain to me what an MSO is? Uh, yeah, it's a multi-shop operator, like uh, Craftsman Collision, for instance. Okay. Okay, yeah, so each location, it's interesting. Um, if a head office applies on behalf of a, a location, we will we will consider that. We will also <laughs> consider applications submitted by each branch. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of a lot of uh, businesses that have multiple locations are independently owned and operated, and so we'll accept an application from from an individual branch. Okay, thank you. Uh, then Terry asked if the grant will also cover lost wages while being trained. No, no. so it's not a wage. We, won't, we don't cover wages. Okay. And then there was a question from Emily if um, the training will be, a, like if you do need to submit uh, the application first uh, and uh, can you submit the... Uh, application for approval and reimbursement when it's completed. So I guess what she means is that uh, if you need to get your training completed uh, before you apply. So um, in an ideal world, an employer would apply and receive a decision before training starts. And then they would pay for and begin training. And then mm -hmm. after training has started, they can submit a reimbursement claim. Mm -hmm. um, if if uh, an employer doesn't receive a decision, before training starts, they may choose to begin training and get a decision after. And if they're approved, it'll be eligible. But if it's not approved, then the employer would be responsible for the full cost of training. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, another question from Lee uh, is, uh, he has a third year apprentice tech and uh, he wonders if they could use this um, grant for his fourth year course. Starting yes. in September. Yes. So for the in, in class uh, training, yes. Okay, perfect. And then Dave asks uh, From an industry perspective, you stated an application cannot be provided by third uh, party provider. Could this be revisited if an organization could demonstrate that they are providing it as, as a service? Uh, for instance, what is a school or, or the ARA, our association? Uh, what do we have to submit on behalf of students registered to a qualified program? So let me tackle the first part. Mm -hmm. um, correct, so the, the application needs to be submitted by the employer. Um, and the reason is that the agreement that is generated by the system and that is a legally binding agreement between the employer and the province is between the employer and the province. And so they need to be the ones to submit the application and sign the attestation. Um, could this be revisited if an organization could demonstrate that they are providing it as a service? Currently, no. 
what is a school or ARA could submit on behalf of students registered to qualify a program? Again, no, at this point, the, the program only renders eligible any application submitted by the employer. There needs to be a, an investment from the employer to, to, to sort of manage this application and to commit to the hiring and the continual employment of the participant upon completion of training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, next question, uh, again from Dave. Uh, if an organization develops um, a program, training program that is not available by trainers in Canada, but only in the US, uh, could the trainer be qualified provided the training took place in Canada? So if the ARA developed a training program that is not available by trainers in Canada, but only in the US, could that trainer, the ARA, I assume, be qualified provided the training took place in Canada. So if an industry association delivers training, then they would be eligible. Uh, so training provider can be a public post-secondary institution. It can be a private training provider. It can also be an industry association. As long as the industry association delivers training as a main business activity, mm -hmm. um, many, many industry associations come to mind that deliver training for, for um, uh, their member companies and employees. Um, and, and we do support training delivered by industry associations. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Uh, also, next question, uh, is a business plan required to apply? No. Nope. And how There's... extensive it would have to be? So, so no business plan is required. Uh, what is required is, I, I went over it quite quickly, but in the application, we ask for the employer to explain how training aligns with the current needs of the business and how training will result in um, improved job security or a better job for participants. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, um, in terms of how extensive that explanation needs to be, um, I'm not sure what kind of guideline to give here, but as long as the um, explanation is clear, uh, that works for us. And, and during, the, during the assessment of every application, if we require more information, uh, we'll follow up with the employer before making a decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then uh, Barbie Murphy uh, had a question, uh, actually it was um, a response for uh, their application that they submitted and it was rejected, it was denied. So I'm just gonna allow her to talk and... Uh, oh, hi there. <laughs> hi. Sorry, I have a lot to say on the subject just because we've applied a number of times. Um, and so recently, one of our applications for an apprentice going through the program was rejected. It um, sat on the system for 60 days and then it times out and they cancel it. Now, um, in the response, it talked about where priority is given and that being first time applicants, small businesses, applicants from disadvantaged regions and applicants from industries facing the greatest challenges. Um, I definitely feel that we fall into that, you know, latter example, um, greatest challenge for unskilled um, workers. Now, um, disadvantaged regions is a very vague concept. You know, some might consider the North Shore like North Vancouver trying to get people to cross the bridge to come over here to work and it's expensive, disadvantaged in relation to even acquiring skilled workers. So how do you define disadvantaged regions? It's a great question. It's actually quite complicated. Um, we, use, we use what we call an index, which looks at, I think, nine or 10 different metrics. Uh, that together give us basically a way to compare regions across the province with one another. And then we set a threshold. Uh, I think it's generally at about the 50% mark. So the, um, the half of uh, regions that are experiencing greater demand for skilled workers are uh, prioritized, whereas the other half is not. Um, it looks at a number of different metrics, such as job postings per capita, unemployment per capita, things like that. So it's a very metrics uh, based um, index, and it's updated every year based on the uh, labor market data that the province releases. I see. Can I add a question to that? Does, is that shared? Can that be that information be shared, or is it um, kind of too complex to be a kind of 
kind of that's, a, that's also a good question and and it, it is too complex but i'd be happy to jump on the phone with you and, and walk you through it if that's something you'd be interested in could small where it discusses small businesses uh, is that where we could look at applying at a shop by shop basis specifically that application was for an apprentice on Vancouver Island, a region that does not offer uh, collision training. So they needed to come to Vancouver, but we applied from a head office BCEID, um, which may have you know, contributed to it not being assessed. Um, but if it was just like our small shop in an area on Vancouver Island, would that be looked at as a small business or would they look at Craftsman Collision, for example, um, as a large business. So if you apply as the as as and I use the term like an own, uh, owner operator or or sort of like an independent entity that operates on Vancouver Island, we would look at that as its own entity. Um, so when I'm thinking about applying for a BC EID, um, is that, will that be looking at our like registered business number that is you know Craftsman Collision as an entity? Or, or could you actually zero in on a, a small independent business, maybe with using the local business license number? Or not right. independent business, but I mean like in the, the branch itself. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can use the branch. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I won't take up more time, but I would like your contact info for more specific questions. <laughs> I was going to just say before we move on the questions, because we'll probably run out of time. I see a lot of questions in the queue. Uh, will you be able to uh, to leave your 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 contact number at the end? Uh, sure. That if, if people oh, excellent. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's let's move forward as many questions as we can uh, for the hour, uh, Eva. Yeah, so we have the next question from Sally asking about um, uh, like skills upgrading. Uh, she's asking if uh, they can apply, for instance, if a uh, collision repair tech wants to increase uh, their skills on repairing electric or, or hybrid vehicles, if, uh, if this grant would also apply for them. Sorry, Eve, I'm trying to follow along in the uh, questions. Oh, it's Sally Chadwick. Oh, okay. What if an occupation does not change, but just allows an employee to stay current in their industry? An example would be auto collision repair. Okay, yeah, no, that's fine. So um, in order to be eligible, training must lead to increased job security or a better job. And so if the nature of work is changing and the and new technology is being introduced and employees are required to learn how to use new machinery, um, it stands to reason that in order to maintain their job security, because the job requires them to know these these skills, that it would be eligible training. And uh, next question from Dave, and you've already touched that when you mentioned that uh, there needs to be a separate application for each course. But uh, this Dave one's is sorry, this one's slightly different. Yeah, yes. so he's asking about the individual. We've we're, we're thinking. So as I mentioned, we're rebuilding that participant invitation in invitation page. And one of the things on our radar is to um, kind of change it so that if there's a there's a participant who apply, who is included on multiple applications, they will have basically a profile that they can just apply to future applications. It does get a little bit tricky because they they need to um, like the details of a participant could change over time as their job changes over time and the, the the wage and the salary changes over time. But it is something that we're aware of. And to a previous comment, I agree that it's a lot of information. Um, a lot of the information that we're required to collect is a requirement from the federal government because our program is actually funded by the federal government. And in order to um, report back to them on how the money is being used, they require that we collect certain information from the participant. And so a lot of what we collect from the participant is, is, is going to serve that purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Shailene asked, uh, can you also apply to pay the employee their wage for the time they spend on a training or just for the tuition? So it's similar. We have. So yeah, no, yeah, we, 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 we don't cover wages. Mm -hmm. yeah, we had that question. So We had that question from Terry yeah, earlier, so. yes. Yeah. Um, what are some of, some of the best ways to find eligible training for staff in BC? Can training be done online or in person only? So we've covered that too, right? You can, right, yeah, so it can be online. Yeah, the first part's interesting. It's we mm -hmm. really we really put the responsibility onto the employer to 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 seek out and find that training that works best for them. But then it can be online or in person, yeah. 
And Haley is asking, how do we verify a training institution is approved for the grant? So that's is there a, a list question. of institutions? Uh... Yeah, it's a good question. We don't pre-approve training providers. We assess every application on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, suffice it to say that if it's, if it's a public post-secondary institution, there's very little, um, 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 if, if all else checks out, there's, there's a very low likelihood that something from a public post-secondary would be rejected. Um, for, private train, for private trainers, what we're really looking for is that the employer has, has done their due diligence and, and selected a private trainer that offers good value for money. Right, and, and then you mentioned for associations, uh, if, if, if training is a, a core part of what they do. Um, yeah, yeah, so well. deliver it as a main business activity. Yeah. Right, okay. Next question, uh, can this training be also, um, can they apply for reimbursement retroactively? So after the training is already? No, so, so in order to be eligible, we need to assess participant eligibility before training begins. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what is ROE. Uh, if an apprentice is issued an ROE when going back to school for their training, not working well in school, would our company still be eligible to apply to, for the tuition for the training? So I'm not sure what an ROE is either. However, if so, the program supports an employer to hire somebody who's currently working for them or who's unemployed. So long as at the conclusion of training, that person will have a increased job security or better job at that employer's business. So I can see this, I can see this falling into one of those two uh, situations. Mm -hmm. And then Dave's question uh, uh, is uh, about the index. Uh, so is BC Grants aware that we maintain our own job board that might not be visible as part of the index? Hmm. I'm not quite sure what he meant by that. Yeah. But. So, so it's it's a I'm I'm not aware of a, a job board, um, for, I guess the association no, um, uh, but the index does look at uh, um, it looks at the it looks I think it looks at the biggest job board in BC in order to determine things like. Uh, um, rates of unemployment and the number of job, the number of job openings in 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 certain um, regions as well. And thanks for clarifying that. So people are just responding that ROE is record of employment. So for instance, ah, okay. if you've been laid off. Ah, okay. So thanks for clarifying that. Um, and uh, yeah, there's the last uh, question. It's quite a long one. I I didn't have a chance to read it. Um, travel food accommodations are the most costly part of the training. Um, one of the requirements to having these expenses covered by the grants is to live in town. I think we answered the question about it, it's just covering the cost of training. It doesn't cover travel or accommodations or anything like that so so as a point of clarification we do support training under certain conditions and our criteria sets thresholds for what those conditions are mm -hmm. to ensure that the training costs are being um, uh, used to support employers in rural and remote locations and so the current cutoff is uh, for folks living in a town with less than twenty five thousand people um, and that they, I think that they have to travel a certain distance uh, one way from uh, their place of employment to training to be eligible. And I think what this person is saying is that they, they've applied, they've tried to pay for training that is, or they've tried to apply for travel expenses that are, that are higher than even the cost of training, but have, have not been successful. And so it's one of those edge cases where the, the, the thresholds in our criteria haven't allowed this employer to take advantage of, of travel costs. Uh, so travel is sort of a case by case and obviously focused in on those very remote rural areas. That's Got right. It. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, I, I see uh, Eva, Mike Kelly uh, has raised his hand just when you can get to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mike, you should be good too. You're on uh, mute as well. I think we might have to unmute him so that he can ask his question yeah. if he still has it. Yeah, Mike, do you still have your question? I asked you to unmute, but uh, 
the final step is on your part. Maybe he's busy now or something. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe he is. Are, are there any other, uh, in the meantime, are there any other uh, questions there that haven't been uh, asked or addressed? Well, Barbie just sent a Google link uh, if somebody's uh, interested in more information about the travel and accommodation coverage uh, for the grant. So um, okay. this is just in the section. Yeah, so the link that's been provided, there's a link to the, the, the eligibility criteria in its entirety. Um, it's, it's significantly shorter now than it was when we had multiple streams. Yes, yes, it is still yes, yes. eight pages, but I would encourage I would encourage everybody before applying to take a read through that to make sure that uh, that they are eligible. Right. Is it? If I see that Mike uh, came back. He's he's off. We'll get back to him. Um, it, is that a link we can just uh, display on the screen uh, that people can come back and reference to? Yeah, for sure. Just so they know where where to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mike. I'm just. I if you're ready to speak. Mike, are you here with yes. us? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize I was on the telephone there with someone. Um, no, I, I, what I'd like is, is, is there any information that you could send me, uh, like an email with a summary of this? So we yeah. have... It's be, being recorded to Mike, so... Yes, so it's going to be recorded and the whole uh, webinar will be available on the Excellent. ARE Excellent. YouTube channel so you can review it. And uh, yeah. yeah, I'd like to share it with our dealers. So uh, mm -hmm. great. Excellent. Thank you. I don't, well, yeah. I don't know if, if it would be helpful, Ken, but as a follow up, we could also circulate. We've got a one pager that's that summarizes basically how to apply and all that. That would be that would be perfect. We could include that uh, in the description if they don't want to watch the whole a webinar again they could just refer to the one pager um and then we thought it is it could we just uh, the the question the the travel portion of we were just going to flash that on the screen or or maybe you, maybe that could just be included in the one page summary uh yes. if it is yeah so the link that barbie provided links to our eligibility criteria um mm -hmm. let me see here it, it actually links to yeah the eligibility criteria and appendix c is the travel policy um, okay, I can uh, let me see here. I've put it in a in a direct message to uh, Eva here. Okay, we can include that then in the description. We don't have to bring it up on the screen. Um, and yeah. Ed is asking where and when will this recording be available? So um, I would say in a couple of days uh, we will just uh, yeah. We don't. We won't do much with the post production, but it's gonna still take a day or two to put it on our YouTube channel. So it's the Automotive Retailers Association YouTube channel. And we will make sure to send uh, all participants a link uh, so you can easily find it. Okay. Uh, well, is, is that, uh, if that's all the, uh, the, the questions that we have, um, excellent. Uh, then I want to uh, thank you, Sean, uh, for taking the time uh, and explaining the, uh, the, the program. Uh, we had recently put out a survey uh, and a very large number uh, have either not applied before or didn't understand it as well. Uh, so I think everyone on this uh, call today is going to really benefit. And thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, attending and submitting your questions. Uh, as Eva said, the recording will be up in a, in, a, in a few days, so check back, but you'll get a notification from us when it is. Uh, and then, Sean, if anyone had uh, any follow-up or questions, how, how would they reach out to you? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I can include contact information, and we can send out maybe a bundle with a one-pager, some contact information, and that a link be, to the... Yeah. That would be, that would be excellent. Okay. Uh, okay, well, having said that, uh, thank you very much, and thank you again, Sean. No problem. Thanks. Sure.